what I'll do at this point. Uh, I'm going to introduce our guest speaker for today, uh, Jerry Brust. He's an IPM vegetable specialist at the University of Maryland and is located at the Central Maryland Research and Education Center near Upper Marlboro. He is responsible for developing new IPM programs for insect pests and new nutrient management programs for vegetable and the Maryland and Mid-Atlantic growers. His recent work examines the use of biostimulants in the vegetables as a tool to reduce pesticides and increase yield and quantity of harvests. Work also includes using endophytic fungi, I should have read this earlier, uh, to help plants resist <laughs> disease such as viruses and bacterial wilt and cucurbits. Before coming to Maryland, he worked for a private mm -hmm. consulting company in Florida, developing biological IPM programs for the company's vegetable growers clientele. Prior to Florida, he worked for Purdue University, developing IPM programs for Midwestern vegetable growers. So here he is, Jerry Brust. So these are some natural enemies. And the reason I talk about natural enemies is because a, a lot of times when you see damage on a plant, you'll start looking around to see what caused the damage on the plant. And what happens a lot of times, you'll mistake a natural enemy that's running around on that damaged plant and you'll think that's the problem because a lot of times the natural enemies look like the pest. And so I, I wanna make sure First of all, before we start talking about pests, that you can identify the good guys. This is one of the good guys. This is probably not one you're going to confuse with a, a pest. This is called a lycosid on the top. It's a wolf spider. And below is a salticid. It's a jumping spider. And so this one on top, the lycosid, the wolf spider, it runs along the surface of the ground and picks up anything that falls off the plant, which is often a, a pest or a of some sort. And the salticids down here, uh, jumping spiders, they'll actually climb the plants and look for uh, natural, uh, for pests. Uh, centipedes are another uh, good uh, predator that we have. They run along the ground surface and they capture any prey that they find and they inject uh, a toxin and I'm pointing to their poison jaws right here, that they grab onto the prey, inject it with a poison, it paralyzes it, and then they can begin to feed on it. Okay, this is a daddy long leg, a uh, harvest man. Uh, they're good predators. Uh, they'll search your plant for uh, pests. And they use these petty palps, i show them right here. And at the end of the petty, Petty palps or chelicerae or jaws that they pick and tear their uh, prey apart. And these guys, uh, usually uh, smaller things like small caterpillars and aphids and mites, but nothing really large. The thing that goes after larger uh, pests are these guys right here. And this group is called carabids. And you spell that C A R B I D S. So it's carabids. And this is a large group that runs around on the ground again. Uh, they're mostly nocturnal. So nobody ever sees these guys at work, but they'll climb your plants and they'll search for uh, pests that are on the plants. So these guys are very valuable to have in your garden. And because they're a little dark and about this size, you can see on the back of someone's hand, uh, people, usually notice them on, on plants uh, when they're present. Uh, but like I said, most of the time, they're, they're only active uh, at night. Okay, this is one of the most common uh, natural enemies you'll have. This is a close up of the immature of the most common one. Does anybody recognize this? This, they're uh, usually black or dark purple and they have yellow or orange spots on them. They have six legs that stick out to the side, and they're pretty voracious predators. We, we rate these on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being a top predator, uh, usually a seven or an eight. 
because they, they concentrate almost solely on your pests on your plant. And they don't eat other insects that aren't pests. So this is a ladybug larvae. This is an immature ladybug larvae. And that's the adult. Adults come in different shapes and sizes. But no matter what size, shape, or color they come in, uh, they always lay eggs that look like this. And so the eggs are usually a yellowish orange color and they're laid on end. And they're usually laid in these very neat little groups that they have. So then the eggs hatch, which is what you see here, and out come the little larvae. Now, if the mom has done a good job of selecting a place to lay her eggs, when they hatch out of these eggs, they'll begin to feed on the pest. If mom has done a poor job of selecting a location, then when these guys hatch out and they run out of food very quickly because mom's done a poor job, they'll become uh, cannibalistic and they'll start to eat each other and start to eat the eggs that are left over. So what you're looking for is anything dark colored with orange or yellow spots and legs out to the side. That is a good guy. And you'll often see these on the underside of the leaf in damaged areas because they're searching for your pest. All right, this is another group of uh, uh, good natural enemies. And this, these are eggs. And these eggs are always laid on a hair-like stalk that you see right here. And at the tips of the eggs, whether it's standing up or laying on the underside of a leaf, eggs are always at the ends of these stalks. Now what happens in nature, you either breed in uh, aggressiveness into your larvae or you take it out. And in this case, for this particular pet or predator, which is a lacewing, they have bred in uh, extreme aggressiveness. So what that means is when this first egg hatches, it's so aggressive that it would immediately eat all its brothers and sisters if it could. And so to get around that, they lay it on these, lay their eggs on these stalks. And so when this one hatches, it climbs up the stalks or down the stalks, goes over here and says, oh, look, there's another egg down there. I'm going to go down and get it. But when it starts to move down the thread, it finds out there's little barbs that stick out like this on either side. And they can't move down towards the egg. And so that protects the egg from uh, other predators and also from the, the lacewing larvae themselves. So it's a way nature gets around things. You breed in aggressiveness, but then you protect the eggs. Okay, this is what the adult looks like. They're green, they have very large wings, and you see where they get the name lace wings from. Uh, but these guys are not predators themselves. They like pollen and nectar. So they don't care about eating other insects, but their offspring do. And that's a good shot of the offspring. Offspring is usually a light color with brown uh, spots. But the thing that's most characteristic about this particular uh, predator is its sickle-like mouth parts you see right here. And these sickle-like mouth parts uh, grab onto a prey. As you can see here, it's grabbed on this aphid. It sucks it dry. It throws it aside. It runs over and gets another one, uh, grabs it, sucks it dry, and moves to another one. So the, they act very fast and uh, very aggressively. This is uh, one attacking a caterpillar a larvae that's probably three times its own weight. And so they'll take on anything, any size. And, and again, that's where the aggressiveness comes in. So we like to see lacewing. And so what you're looking for are these lacewing eggs. This is what you're going to see most of the time. And you're not going to see the larvae. But if you see anything that's sort of shaped like an alligator, look for these sickle-like mouth parts because they stand out and they're quite noticeable. All right, another group, and I'm only throwing this in because this particular group, Aureus insidiosus, insidious flower bug, uh, they're part of the minute pirate bug group. 
are very good predators of thrips. They love to go after thrips. And this is the adult right here. And adults are usually in a very similar uh, color pattern. They're dark on top, then light in the middle, then dark again with a little wedge shape, clear area on the back of their wing. This is the immature. It's orange with red spots and they feed by sucking juices out of their prey. And so these guys go after thrips. So you'll often find them in flowers. They're very small, you usually don't see them. And that's why they're good to be in flowers because they can get in amongst the petals and search for the thrips. This is a little sunflower flower uh, that I had. I uh, irritated uh, some of the uh, inner parts of the sunflower to see if I could get aureus to run out, and I did. And my arrow circling one of the aureus. And the, you can see the size of them, very small, but you can see the color pattern. It's dark on top, light in the middle, and then dark in the back end with a little white patch. So that's kind of what you're looking for when you look for these in a flower. And you will find these in most flowers because they're going after thrips that are usually found uh, feeding on your flowers. Okay, I always ask the group, uh, what do you think this is? And most people say some kind of bee, some kind of hymenoptera. And this is actually a fly. And how do I know it's a fly even though it looks like a bee? It's because it has two wings. All other insects that fly have four wings. So only the diptera or flies have two wings. So I realized this is a fly, not a wasp. And the reason we think it's a, a, a wasp is because of the color pattern. In nature, when you have yellow or orange up against black, that is a warning sign. And it's warning others to stay away from me. I'm poisonous or I'll hurt you. And so things over millennia have learned to stay away from any kind of bright coloration like this. And so this fly is mimicking a bee so that other things will leave it alone. The thing I'm, I'm, I'm the reason I'm showing this to you is because this particular group are called surfid flies. And you spell that S-Y-R-P-H-I-D, surfid flies. They're also called flower flies or even sweat flies. They like to hover around your sweat, right around your eyes, and drink the sweat uh, on your face uh, during the summer. They look remarkably like bees at times. Some of them uh, don't, but most of them do look like a bee. Okay, their offspring are maggots, uh, but they're predatory maggots. And this is a good example of one of the predatory maggots. It's feeding on an aphid. They like soft-bodied insects and other pests like mites and thrips and maybe eggs of insects. Most of them aren't this pretty. And this is, happens to be a pretty one. Most of them are this nondescript little slug-like thing that you might find on a leaf. And so it's good to know when, uh, that this is actually a predator when you see one on your leaf rather than mistaking it for something that's going to eat your leaf. So these are called surfid flies or flower flies. Another type of fly, and this is a very large group, uh, they're called tachinids. And tachinids, uh, for the most part, look like robust house flies. They look like house flies that have been taking steroids. And on their back end, you see these seedy, and that distinguishes them from a house fly, which would not have this. But these guys are a little bit different. And what they do is the female will go up and lay her eggs directly on her host. And so this is what the eggs look like on the host. And these eggs are a little bit smaller than a grain of rice. And they're usually laid up by the head. Not always, but usually. And what happens is these eggs will hatch they don't hatch from the outside. They hatch on the bottom side and they hatch directly into, the, in this case, the caterpillar. 
and then they go inside the caterpillar and they begin to feed on it. And we'll see what happens a little later to this uh, poor caterpillar. This is a, a picture of mine. I just wanted to show you the size of the eggs. This is a tachinid egg on a caterpillar. This is something else right here that I can't go into discussion about, but it's kind of interesting. Uh, but I wanted to show you the size and where the eggs usually show up on a caterpillar. So if you see caterpillars uh, out in your garden, take a look at them and see if they have these little white uh, rice grains stuck to their body. They don't come off, all right? And so this tells you that there's a tachinid inside that caterpillar. And you don't necessarily want to squish it or kill it because the tachinid will come out and parasitize other caterpillars. And if you kill or squish that uh, caterpillar when it has these eggs on it, you'll kill a natural enemy. That's going to help you out later. Okay, this is a tachinid larvae inside a stink bug. And so you can see the little brown patch right here. That's the tachinid inside the stink bug. And you see its egg that it originally laid, the mother did a long time ago, right up here, this little bump. Again, eggs are often laid up by the head. And so that's where you want to look for it on a particular pest, is whether or not it has these little white eggs near their head. Okay, this is what it looks like. This is the tachinid larvae right here. And this was that caterpillar that had the eggs on it. And only one tachinid larvae is going to make it. And you can see they're quite large. And this will spin a cocoon. And then it'll become an adult and start the whole process over again. So it's kind of gruesome uh, what they do, but they're a very effective uh, natural enemy. Uh, Trichopoda panopes happens to be a, a different type of tachinid. It's, again, it's a fly. And they have orange abdomens okay, with these dark, smoky wings. And if you have squash plants out in your garden right now, uh, July, August, you'll start to see these guys. And you'll look for the orange abdomens. They really, the orange abdomen really stands out with these dark wings. And these guys like to parasitize squash bugs. So if you have squash bug problems, these guys are the ones that are going to be searching for the squash bugs, laying eggs on them that hatch and eventually kill them. Now I've been working with Trichopoda penopes for a couple of years now, and I'm trying to increase their numbers in June, July to high enough numbers where they're gonna have some influence in reducing squash bugs. Most of the time Trichopoda becomes very uh, high populations uh, in August and September. And so they miss the peak population of the squash bugs by about a month. So we're trying to get them to come on a little bit earlier so that they can help us control the squash bugs. But I haven't had a lot of success with it yet. So what you wanna look for are these orange abdomens with these dark wings. You will see them in your squash uh, another large group are called parasitic wasps, and this is a, an example of one. They come in all different shapes and sizes. This one happens to be medium-sized wasp. This one's a very tiny wasp right here, and it's laying its egg on the egg of a tomato hornworm. And these eggs are very tiny right here the, from the hornworm. Uh, you could probably fit five or six of them on the head of a pin. And this one is laying its egg. So you can imagine how tiny it, it, its egg is that's laying it on this particular egg. But this is a very good natural enemy because what happens, it lays its egg, the egg hatches, and it eats the egg of the pest. And so the pest never turns into a larvae, never turns into adult. And so we get rid of it very early on. So... This particular uh, wasp is called a trichogramma. Uh, the wasps also come in different sizes. Some are very large and they go after much larger prey. This is an example you see all the time. They have pictures of things like this. This is a hornworm right here. 
And these white things on his back are not eggs. People always think they're eggs, but they're really cocoons. Okay? They're cocoons of the wasps that fed on the inside of the aphid. In order to spin the cocoon, they come outside of the caterpillar, they spin a cocoon, and so in that cocoon, they turn from a larvae into an adult wasp. Right? Well, this is what you're seeing here. And I always hold this up as this is a real bad example of pest management. And the reason it's a bad uh, example of pest management is what are we trying to do in pest management? We're trying to reduce the amount of damage done by a particular pest, okay? All right, how much damage do you think this giant worm has done in that tomato plant? That's right, it's done a lot of damage. It's already eaten a lot of food and it's still alive and it's still going strong. The, the reason this is going to work is because when this caterpillar pupates, it won't have enough energy to transform from a, pu uh, from a larvae into an adult. And so it dies as a pupae, which ecologically, that's good. That's a good thing. And so we want this to happen. But pest management wise, as far as protecting our crop, it isn't a good thing because these guys become huge and they do the damage to our crop. And this particular natural enemy doesn't help us a whole lot. It help us, helps us in the big picture, but doesn't help us in the small picture. Okay, that's just what I want to point out. And so this is uh, some of my uh, photos. Uh, you can see that each one of these uh, cocoons has a little lid. It's been opened. The wasp has emerged. And I just brushed the cocoons off of this caterpillar and the caterpillar goes on just fine. It, like I said, so when it pupates, it will die as a pupae. Okay. This is one of the last things we'll look at as far as predators. These are a bunch of aphids right here. And there's two things in the picture that tell me I'm not going to treat these aphids. I don't have to, they'll be dead here in another week or two. And the two things are this and this right here. And these are called mummified aphids. And what mummified aphids are, are aphids in which a parasitic wasp has gone up to an aphid and laid an egg on the inside of the aphid. That egg hatches and the larvae begin to eat the aphid from the inside out. And so this parasitic wasp will eat everything on the inside of that aphid. There'll be nothing left except the outer exocuticle. And they can't eat the exocuticle uh, nothing can dissolve an exocuticle of an insect. Well, not nothing, but it's very difficult to dissolve an exocuticle of an insect. And you can see this by all the cicadas skins on, a, on trees. It's because that particular part of the insect couldn't be broken down by anything. So the parasite, the predator, stays on the inside of the aphid, eats it, pupates inside the aphid and becomes an adult. And when it's ready, it chews a hole in the back of the aphid and then lifts open a lid and emerges as a whole uh, wasp. And it starts to cycle all over again. So one wasp can lay anywhere, female wasp, anywhere from 100 to 300 eggs. So that's one egg per aphid. So you can see they very quickly can knock down a population. But the, the wasps are very sensitive to insecticide. So if you spray an insecticide, uh, you're gonna kill these wasps when they emerge. This just shows you the general size of these uh, mummified aphids next to my thumb. And, and it just tells you what, what kind of size and what you should be looking for out in your garden. Okay. So everybody's an expert now on this. Uh, the blue line, can you tell me what that's pointing to? Correct, it's pointing to a mummified aphid. The red lines are pointing to mummified aphids 
in which the wasp has emerged and is now active and is probably laying eggs on the yellow line, which is pointing to a normal aphid. And so it probably has eggs in it that are going to start hatching and eating aphid from the inside out. So you want to look for these mummified aphids whenever you see a bunch of aphids to see if you these parasitic wasps are present. If they are, just let them go and they'll reduce the population within a week or two. Okay, for all these predators, for the soil dwelling predators, they like to have some kind of organic mulch. So if you can put some kind of organic mulch in your garden, uh, straw or, or chopped up leaves or something like that, you'll invite these predators into your garden and they won't cause any problems, but they'll, they'll help uh, reduce your prey or your pests, I should say. Uh, the other thing for all the other uh, predators and parasitoids, they like nectar and pollen. So if you can have some flowers within your garden, if the flowers are nearby, that's fine, but they do a much better job, the natural enemies, if the flowers are within your garden, in your vegetable garden, because then the natural enemies move from the flower to search your plants, back to the flower, back to searching your vegetable. So they go back and forth like that all day. And so it's much more efficient for them and they don't get lost or confused and start to fly somewhere else after they leave your flowers. So those are the two things you can do, straw mulch and flowers within your, your garden. Okay, now I'm gonna move on to the pests. What kind of pests are we gonna see? But one thing I wanna mention, I'm gonna mention as a control possibility, uh, a row cover. And so I want, just wanted to show you what I mean when I talk about row cover. This is one type of row cover. It's a light, lighter row cover than this one. This is a heavier row cover but they do a very good job of protecting the plants from uh, pests. And sometimes organically, it's the only thing we really have that'll keep the pests off the plant. And they allow the uh, vegetable to grow very well. Vegetables grow very well under these row covers. They're a little bit of a pain to put up, but once you put them up, uh, you can probably leave them until the plant starts to flower and you have to have pollination. That's the only thing that's uh, it's a real pain with them is to take the row covers off when the plants need pollination. Okay, so these are some of the most common pests and we're gonna start with aphids. You'll see aphids almost every year and they'll get on all kinds of plants. Just about every plant in the garden can have aphids on it. And the aphids, feed by sucking sap out of the plant. So they don't create holes in the plants. They put their mouth parts in the plants and they suck sap. And what they do, they concentrate the sap and then push it out the other end of them as poop. And that poop comes out as what we call honeydew. And that's what you see the shiny stuff here and over here. It's honeydew and it's sticky and it's sort of like syrup because it's concentrated sugary sap. And we do the same thing and we, we put it on our pancakes, uh, maple trees. And so that's what the aphids do. They concentrate that sap, pass it through them. They're not interested in the sugars. They're going after amino acids in the sap. And unfortunately, uh, sap has very little amino acids. So they have to pass a lot of it through their bodies, okay? So as, as they suck on the plant and, and if there's a lot of them, they start to weaken the plant. And over time, the aphids become more numerous and the plant becomes weaker and weaker. Okay, the neat thing about aphids, and there are a lot of neat things if you just want to study a particular insect, uh, even though it is a pest, is that in the summertime, uh, female aphids, and this is a female aphid, adult, don't lay eggs. They give live birth to clones of themselves, okay? So this female is giving live birth 
to a clone of herself. So all the aphids she produces right here that you see are clones. There's no mating in the summer with a, a males. Matter of fact, a lot of times you cannot find any males, aphids in the summer. It's all females. And then once this little guy and this little guy become adults, which takes in the summer about 10 days to two weeks, they will start to produce uh, clones of themselves and give live birth. And you can see how the population can increase very rapidly. Okay. Uh, what do you think is going on here? And, and nothing kinky. Uh, it, I always amazed that a lot of people know what's going on here. And that is this ant is milking this aphid. And it does this by using its antenna. It goes up and strokes the aphid. And when the aphid feels that stroking by the ant, it gives it a bit of honeydew. And the ant just loves that sweet uh, liquid. And so it'll do a lot to get that sweet liquid. So it gets, the ant gets a lot out of it just by stroking the aphid, it gets this sugary substance. But the aphids also get something out of the relationship. And these little pipes on the back of the aphid are called cornicles. And if I were to go up to this particular aphid and poke it or even uh, try to kill it, it would release from these cornicles uh, an aromatic liquid that almost instantly is airborne and the other aphids smell it very quickly. And, and this group here, if they smelled it, would all, all of a sudden start to run. And it's called an alarm pheromone. So when aphids are being attacked, they give off this alarm pheromone and the other aphids run from the area. Now, if these aphids know that there's these ants around it, stroking them for the sugary substance, and something goes up and starts to pick on them or tries to eat them, and they release this alarm pheromone, the other aphids around that aphid will not run. They don't respond to that alarm pheromone now. What does respond to that alarm pheromone are the ants. And so once those ants smell that alarm pheromone, they run to the source of it. And anything that's bothering the aphids, they either kill it or they throw it off the plant. And so they end up protecting the aphids, which they think of as their cows. And so they're herding their cows and taking care of them and protecting them from predators. And this can be somewhat important in a, in a garden or any kind of situation. If you have what are, these ants are called attendant ants because they're attending the, the aphids. And so these attendant ants get the sugary substance from the aphids and in return, they protect the aphids from natural enemies. And so if you've got a bunch of aphids, you think, oh, well, the natural enemies will probably take care of them. They usually do but they won't if they have attendant ants. Those aphids will just keep reproducing and the ants will just keep on protecting them. It, you don't see this very often, but you do once in a while. And it's, it's fascinating to, to watch. Uh, and so I would suggest rather than trying to fix it or do something, just go ahead and watch what's happening with these ants and the aphids. And it, like I said, it's quite fascinating. Okay, uh, this is also uh, a very common uh, pest. These are called thrips. Uh, they like to feed on flowers. And their, their common name are called uh, flower thrips. And this is the size of them. They're very small. They're elongate. They're orange to yellow. Uh, you can see a bunch of them on this one leaf. And so their numbers can get up pretty high before you realize that they're there. This is a close-up of one of them. You'll never see a thrips this close-up ever again. And I know you probably don't want to, uh, but they have one jaw uh, 
And that one jaw, in order to get nutrients from a plant, they scrape the plant. And so this scraping on the plant is called stippling. And there's one other thing that does stippling damage like this, and those are two-spotted spider mites. So this is what you want to look for, not the thrips and not even the mites, but you want to look for the stippling. You see the little white dots all over these leaves? This has too much stippling on it, by the way. This is a little bit too far gone. We don't want to see this much stippling. All these little white dots are where the thrips or the mites have scraped off the chlorophyll, and the only thing left is this damaged tissue, right? So when you start to see these little stipples, like this little white dot and that one, and that one, and that one, that tells you you have either thrips or mites. And that's what I start looking for. I try to figure out, is it thrips or is it mites? Because that'll tell me a difference in how I'm going to treat it. And so uh, this is a basil leaf that has thrips feeding. And you see the thrips feeding is kind of heavy in places. But the thing that distinguishes it from mite feeding are these little black dots that you see here. And this is a close-up of the black dots. And these black dots are called, are, are feces. So this is thrips feces. Mites don't have black feces. They have clear or white feces, so you really don't see them. But thrips have black feces. So what you're gonna be looking for is the stippling, the white dots that have black dots inside of them, right? That tells you you have thrips. And that's what you want to look for on a plant. Oftentimes you will not see the thrips or you'll need a 10X hand lens to see the thrips. And so you look for the damage that they cause. This is very characteristic damage of either thrips or mites. And in this case, because of the black specks, we know it's thrips. All right. One of the things that they can cause, the thrips can cause in something like a tomato or the fruit is they have overposition. This is where they lay their eggs and they cause a little dimple in the fruit. One or two dimples isn't a big deal, but when you've got lots of them, it, it can make the fruit look bad. And the Western flower thrips, and we single out Western flower thrips because uh, they transmit viruses. And that's number one. Number two, they're very resistant to chemicals. So you can't control them with chemicals. Uh, they have a little white halo around their little dimple. There's the dimple and here's the white halo. And so that's very characteristic of Western flower thrips. Hopefully you'll never see that in your fruit. You'll see more of these dimples. That's just a Eastern flower thrips problem. And Eastern flower thrips are not that difficult to control. Okay, how I would control uh, thrips if uh, they're in my flowers or uh, on my vegetables is I would use a spinosad. It's called Entrust. Is it a product name? It's all also goes by uh, Captain Jack's worm killer or insect killer, something like that. It goes by different names, but this is the active ingredient. It's called spinosa. And it works very well in control of thrips. Okay? I'd recommend to most gardeners that they're going to buy one product to control their pests. They buy something that has spinosa as the active ingredient. In the last uh, four or five years, uh, if you store it in a, uh, a, a good area, doesn't get too hot, doesn't get too cold type of area. It, it controls other things besides thrips, which we'll talk about. You can also use insecticidal soaps and horticulture oils, but you'll need to use those like four or five times. You can't spray insecticidal soaps or hort oils just once and expect them to work. They won't. You need to spray them once, four or five days later, four or five days later, four or five days later, and then they'll start to control the pest. Okay. Okay, there's one other thing you can try depending on what your interests are. And this is the active ingredient is a fungus 
It's called Bavaria bastiana. And it only attacks insects. Will not attack the plant, won't attack people or dogs or anything else, only insects. And the product name, there's two, there's Botanigard and Naturalis. And it does a good job on reducing uh, thrips and mites, uh, but it does not work when it gets real hot. That's its big drawback. And you have to apply it like three or four times also. And what you're doing is building up the fungus on the plant so that when the pest comes along and encounters the spores, the spores begin to grow on the insect. And that's what's happening in these pictures. The spores have germinated and then they go into the insect and kill it. And so that's what you see the fungus doing is killing the insect. All right, the next, the last big group that you're gonna run into, aphids, thrips, and these are mites. These are two spotted spider mites. And the, these are the eggs that they lay, very large eggs. And you can see how they get their names. They're sort of this yellowish green color with two big dark spots on either side of them. And they like a lot of different insects, I mean, uh, plants to feed on. Okay, this is the type of damage and it looks just like thrips damage. Uh, again, it's called stippling. And when they get really bad, uh, the stippling, and what stippling is, is the removal of chlorophyll from the plant, which you don't want. And so when you get enough stippling, you've released, you've gotten enough chlorophyll out of the plant that the, the plant eventually goes down and dies. And so you can see here, it's too late with this. With two spotted spider mites, the other thing that distinguishes them from thrips and other pests is that they will spin webs and they'll have a webbing. And then they do this once they get in large groups. And what this webbing does is coat the underside of the leaf with their webbing and that protects them not only from predators, but from any sprays you might wanna use. The sprays are not gonna get to the mites because they're protected underneath this webbing. So what the one thing you, you need to do is remove this webbing. Usually by the time I see webbing like this on a plant, that plant is basically gone. And the best thing to do if you see webbing like that is to uh, destroy the plant, put it in a plastic bag and throw it away. If you really love that plant and you wanna save it, then you'll have to remove this webbing as best you can. And there's ways you can do that. And then you can get to the mites. So two spotted spider mites, feed by sucking chlorophyll out of the plant. All right. One of the ways you can control them is using a spray of water on the underside of the leaf. This will help destroy the webbing and it'll help wash the mites off of the plant. Now you don't need to use a fire hose like this thing. This is just the best picture I could get. A garden hose will work fine. You just need to get it on the underside of the leaf, which is difficult to do in order to get at the mites. Okay. Soaps and horticulture oils work real well on mites. I, I'm always surprised by how, how well it works. And it often works better than any of the hard chemicals that uh, commercial grower, vegetable growers use to control the mites. But first you have to get rid of any webbing. Then you can use a soap and then move to a horticulture oil one or two applications, and then back to the soaps. You can also use the Bavaria bassiana that we talked about earlier for two spot spider mites. Okay, those are three pests that get on a lot of different crops. So, so that's why I looked at them individually. Now we're gonna look at some uh, crops themselves and what seems to be the biggest thing that gets on them. And these are crucifers and brassicas. And they have three big ones, worms, harlequin bugs, and flea beetles. And the biggest one is worms, caterpillars. And this is a first instar caterpillar. It just hatched from an egg. This is the second instar caterpillar. It 
needs to grow. So it sheds the skin, becomes a third instar. It needs to grow, it sheds the skin, becomes a fourth instar, and then a fifth instar. And then it pupates and then becomes a moth. Okay. What we want to do when we run into caterpillars is we want to control them when they're this size or this size. We don't want to try to control them when they're this size. They're too hard to control when they're that big. So how do we know when we have worms this small in our garden? And there's a way to do that, just by looking at the plant. And this is the type of damage right here and here and here that small worms do. And it's called window pane because it sort of looks like a window pane, a glass. And what this tells you is the worm is so small when it feeds on the underside of the leaf where the tender tissue is, it cannot chew all the way through the leaf. And so that upper epidermis layer, it can't chew, chew through when it's a small caterpillar. And so I don't even need to look for the caterpillar, although I will look for the caterpillar and see if I have them. Because a lot of times they're actually missing, they're gone. Because these predators I talked about earlier have taken them out. So you want to see if you have uh, actually have the worms present. Uh, it, it tells you that the worms are present and they're very small. Now, when they you start to see holes like this, what does that tell you about the worm? That's right. The worm is getting bigger now and we need to do something. You need to make a decision right now in the next day or two about what you're going to do to control that worm if you want to control it. Once it starts to get bigger than this and gets up to a third, fourth instar where they're fairly large, then this is what your crop is going to look like. So this is too late to do anything, obviously. You want to do something back at this stage of the plant. That worms are easy to control at this point and they're not going to do much damage. So what is a good way to control caterpillars? And when they're really small, you can use BT or the spinosad again that I talked about that controls thrips. That's why I recommend it. If the spinosad will get and control most caterpillar uh, pests. The BT also will get caterpillar pests. Not quite as well as the spinosad. Spinosad will do better. BT is Bacillus thuringiensis. And it's a soil bacterium that organic growers have been using for 50 years. But they now have versions of it that do a much better job that when you spray them on a leaf, they'll sit on a leaf and not decay because of ultraviolet light. So they'll sit on the leaf, the caterpillar comes, it has to eat the leaf in order to ingest the BT. And then, once inside a caterpillar, it kills the caterpillar. Now, the good thing about BT, it will only kill caterpillars. It will not kill any other insect. So you don't have to worry about it harming uh, bees or uh, pollinators. Spinosad will hurt pollinators somewhat, but not, not real bad. Uh, BT will not hurt pollinators at all. Only worms, only caterpillars will it kill. Okay, so those are the two things I'd recommend. But you have to do it when the caterpillars are small. Once they get up to medium size and larger, they're much more difficult to control with these products. But the spinosad still will work even in medium-sized caterpillars. The BT will too, but not, not quite as well as it did before. Okay, harlequin bugs are a pain. I'll just tell you that right now. They, they are a pain. Commercial growers don't like to see them because even with their harder chemicals, they have a hard time controlling harlequin bugs. And these bugs, as you can see, are uh, orange and black coloration. They're true bugs, which means they feed by sucking plant juices out of the plant. They suck the chlorophyll out. And they do this by injecting an enzyme into the plant and the enzyme 
breaks down the cell walls of the leaf, and then the insect sucks up all the juices that came out of the cell walls. Now, when that happens, the cell walls die and you get these dark spots. So if you have a lot of harlequin bugs, or if you have harlequin bugs that have been feeding for days and days, you're gonna get a leaf that looks something like this or worse. So you're gonna get a lot of dead tissue. This is where the harlequin bugs injected their enzyme into the leaf in order to break down the cell walls to get the juices out. Okay. So the harlequin bugs are here in the spring and they're here in the fall, but they're much worse in the fall. So they're difficult to control with anything. There's no chemical that really controls them real well. And what I use for all my planting, especially fall planting, I don't do it much in the spring because I don't have much of a problem with them. But in my crucifers, I plant in the fall, I use row covers. And I cover them up. And they grow very well underneath the row cover. I don't have to uncover them because they're not going to flower. And I don't need the pollination on them. So I just go ahead and leave them under the row covers. And they're safe from harlequin bugs. <clears throat> All right. These are some of the major uh, pests that we have in tomato pepper, other solanacea crops. We've already talked about a bunch of these, but now we'll talk about Colorado potato beetle and stink bugs and flea beetles here. Colorado potato beetle likes solanacea crops. They especially like eggplant, but they'll also go after potatoes with a gusto. Uh, Tomatoes are okay and peppers are okay. If they don't have anything else, they'll eat those happily. But they'll only eat solanacea crop. They won't eat uh, cucurbits, let's say, or, or corn or anything like that. This is what the adult looks like. Uh, it has a bunch of stripes on its back, uh, orange uh, thorax and head. But these are the really bad guys. These are the immatures. These are the larvae. And they sort of have this humpback look. I think most people know Colorado potato beetle probably. Uh, this is a very young larvae. These are older larvae. And they can consume a lot of material. And they can defoliate a plant very quickly. Uh, the adults become active early in the spring, about the time when potatoes start to come up. And they start to lay eggs. Now, the adults overwinter basically in the same area where you had potatoes the year before. So wherever you had potatoes, that's where they're going to overwinter in the ground. And so the next year, if you can move your potatoes and don't have them or any solanacea crop from where you had them before and rotate out of that, you'll be much better off. But it's I know it's difficult to rotate very far in a garden. So the... Colorado potato beetle is, is going to find your solanacea plants that you have out in the field as they emerge from the ground in the early spring. Okay. So biocontrol can help with this predator. Uh, you have to use mulch uh, around the potato plants. This will increase the carabids I talked about earlier. The carabids will climb the plant and actually feed on the immatures. Uh, but the thing I use and what most other people use is spinosad. So there's three major pests that spinosad controls. And no, I don't have stock in spinosad. I don't sell it. It's just something that works very well. And, and it's also uh, organically a, approved. So our, our organic organizations approve of spinosad being used because it's so safe. Uh, it gets very good control of Colorado potato beetle. So it controls thrips, Colorado potato beetle, and a whole host of worms. This is one product. That's why I recommend a gardener to get spinosad as an active ingredient, okay? Because it'll control some of your more major pests. One thing it will not control are stink bugs. There's not much to control stink bugs. Again, they're sort of like harlequin bugs. 
in that the growers don't have any really good chemicals uh, to control them. And certainly gardeners don't have good control of them. Okay, this is just the general shape. This is the adult, they're sort of shield shaped bugs and they're true bugs. So they feed by sucking juices out of the plant. But they don't inject a lot of uh, toxins or enzymes into the plant. So we don't, really don't see any leaf damage that they do. Uh, they have a tendency though to feed on the fruit and that becomes a problem. Because this is what happens to a tomato fruit that a stink bug is fed on. They, this is their feeding damage right here. They stick their mouth parts in, suck out the juices, and the only thing that's left behind is air. And so these air pockets that form in the tomato show up as these white blotches. And these white blotches are often called cloudy spot. So if you have cloudy spot of tomatoes, the, the damage was done by stink bugs, and usually by immature stink bugs, but sometimes adults. Uh, so this is the cloudy spot right here. This is what it looks like. If you remove the epidermal layer of skin, that very thin layer of skin, this is what it looks like underneath. And so this is squishy areas right here. And they're squishy because they're just empty cells. The cells have been sucked dry by the stink bug. But you see that they, they don't leave behind any enzymes and they don't do any other damage other than sucking the uh, liquid out of the cells. Okay. So in that case, they're a little bit better than harlequin bugs. The problem with stink bugs is that they bury themselves inside the plant. So if you have a plant, tomato plant this large, they're gonna be deep down inside where it's very dark and it's difficult to get any kind of spray program or any kind of control spray to the insects. You just can't do it. And so therefore it's difficult to control stink bugs. I'll just tell you that right now. Uh, commercial growers have a hard time with them. The other thing is the adults come and go because adults can fly. They come into a garden or a couple of plants. They feed for an hour or two. Sometimes they might stay a day and then they leave. If that plant is disturbed at all, they immediately drop to the ground they crawl off and then they fly off. So it's difficult to control them. If as soon as you start touching that plant, they drop to the ground, you're looking for a stink bug and you'll never see one. And so oftentimes you see the damage, but you don't see the stink bug because they're so good at escaping. One of the things that helps a lot are these tachinids I talked about earlier. They attack stink bugs and squash bugs. Remember I showed you this picture? There's the, the tachinid egg. There's the tachinid larvae inside the stink bug. And so you can build their population up in your garden, the tachinids, by having flowering plants in your garden at the same time that you have tomato fruit. Because the tachinids will come to the flowers and then they'll need to lay eggs. And so they'll go in search of a host. In this case, they're going in search of stink bugs to lay their eggs on. Okay. Uh, the other group of the Solanacea that are, are a problem, they're also a, a problem of crucifers too, are uh, flea beetles. And this is the usual shape and size of them. They're, they're not big beetles. They're, they're not real small either, uh, but they like to defoliate plants. And they can defoliate plants rather quickly. They're usually dark colored, but some are striped, uh, some are yellow. Uh, they either do uh, this type of defoliation or they shred the, the, the chlorophyll off the plant, or they make these shot holes in the plant. And then you can see two uh, beetles right here, flea beetles right here. And they get the name flea beetles because their uh, hind legs are greatly enlarged so that if you disturb them, they jump very quickly. And it looks like they disappear uh, because you don't see them 
jump so rapidly and they jump out of the area. Uh, this is the type of damage they do, these shot hole appearances. The, the thing about them is if you want to use pyrethroids, and this is the synthetic pyrethroids, these are the ones that are a little bit dangerous. I, most people don't want to use them. Growers will. If you use the pyrethroid, they kill the flea beetles dead. Okay, You need one spray of them, and that's it. But most people don't want to use pyrethroids, which I understand. All the other uh, organic pesticides we, we have will not control flea beetles. Okay, I don't care what anybody tells you. Uh, we've tested lots of them, and none of them work on flea beetles. The thing that does work is row covers. And so you cover up your plant. And the flea beetles are only a real danger to plants when they're small. They will put holes in larger plants like this, but the plants can outgrow that damage. Okay. So once the plants get up above five, six leaf, uh, whatever plant that is, I'll, I'll take the row covers off if I need pollination. If not, I just leave the row covers on until the plants get big enough, they start to push up against it. And then I might remove the row cover. But once the plants get fairly large sized, uh, the uh, flea beetles aren't going to do much damage. They'll, they'll put holes in the leaves, but the plant can handle that and not reduce yield or hurt the, the quality of your uh, produce. So it, it's worth doing a little bit of row covering if you have flea beetle problems. Okay? Again, you have to rotate because the flea beetles overwinter in the ground, much like Colorado potato beetle. They overwinter in the ground. Okay. So you don't want to go back where you had flea beetles uh, attacking something and go back into that same place the next year because I guarantee you, you'll have flea beetles again. Rotate out of that and put a crop in that flea beetles don't like, like squash or something. Uh, no crucifers, no tomatoes, and you'll be much better off if you can rotate. Okay, I talked about aphids earlier. The one thing I wanted to mention about aphids is they transmit viruses and they do this very well. They're very good at transmitting viruses. And sometimes the virus is rather mild, what it does to the plant. Other times it's much harsher, what the virus does and it gets into the plant. But these are called mosaic viruses and there's many mosaic viruses, many different types. And the aphids carry almost all of them. And so what they do, they go up to a plant and they and put their mouth part into it. And their mouth part is like a needle. And when they put their mouth part needle, needle mouth part into the plant, they have the virus on that needle mouth part. And so they instantly can infect the plant just by tasting it. They don't have to sit there and feed. This is what confuses a lot of people. Because uh, I'll say, oh, you got a virus that was transmitted by an aphid. And they say, no, no, I can't find any aphids on my plants. And, and they're probably right. They have no aphids on their plant. But the aphid infected the plant just by tasting it, didn't like the taste of it, and they flew off and went to another plant or went to another garden. But the damage is already done. They've already infected it with this virus. And so if you see your plant starting to look kind of weird, weird shaped leaves, especially on new growth, viruses always attack new growth. They don't attack old growth. And you can see that right here. This is the old growth, not attacked by the virus. This is the new growth, that is what's attacked by the virus. And fruit growing on a plant is new growth. It's very rapidly dividing cells. And that's what viruses like to get to, rapidly dividing cells. And so they'll attack the fruit. And if they infect the plant before the fruit has formed on that plant, there will be no fruit on that plant, okay? The virus will attack uh, the fruit as it's forming and cause it to, uh, decay and rot off before it even gets a chance to form. 
So you're going to look for these squirrely leaves that often have a mosaic pattern on the leaf, light and dark green. And that tells you you have a virus. And that virus most likely came from aphids. All right. What are some things you can do? You can use resistant varieties to certain uh, viruses. Squash mosaic virus is one that they have resist, that squash has resistant to. So you can look for that if these viruses are a problem. If they're not, I wouldn't worry about it much. You can plant early because aphid populations take time to uh, really build. And so the earlier you plant, whatever it is you're trying to get uh, produce from, fruit from, the better off you are from viruses. And you can use what I have here, reflective mulch. Now the reflective mulch keeps the aphids from actually landing on the plant. So the aphids fly by, look down, all they see is sky because it's reflected. And so they don't want to land. So they just keep moving on. So this reflective mulch works real well. And you can see this is down in Florida where I work. And this grower is having problem with uh, viruses. And so we compared the reflective mulch with the white mulch they usually use in this particular field. And the reflective mulch re worked real well. It reduced the number of virus plants by 95%. Now, of course, the problem is you have to use a reflective mulch. And once the plants get big enough and they cover that mulch, it doesn't work anymore. And so the, the uh, aphids can land on the plants and infect it with the virus. But by that time, the plants are pretty big and you already have fruit being developed. Now that fruit, even though the plant gets infected, will go ahead and develop normally. And so you'll be able to harvest fruit off of it. But if it hasn't developed, when it gets infected with the virus, you will get no fruit. Okay. okay. Another one is squash vine borer. And I just noticed I've gone, I know you guys told me you quit at 11.30. Uh, do you want me to go on? Or do you want me to uh, go ahead and stop here? Oh, um, Jerry, I, you, you want to take a few questions, uh, if you could? I, th I think it's uh, it's eleven thirty, but uh, actually eleven fifty three. But if you want to do for maybe five or six questions or something like that, guys. Is that, sure. Uh, is that is that doable? Uh, let's see, uh, let's see, we got Patricia and Anthony there. Yeah, um, I have nine questions, and um, I will warn you that the, the lawn service is here, and they're they're mowing my lawn. So hopefully, you you can hear me. Um, the first question that we have is: Well, the the tachinids, the good flies, will they parasitize good larvae like ladybugs and all the bugs that we're trying to um, trying to to encourage? Uh, good, good question. No, they will not. Uh, they'll, uh, the tachinids will only go after caterpillars, squash bugs, stink bugs, things like this, but they won't go after any of our uh, predators. That's encouraging. Um, is there a place where we can buy some of these good predators that you've been talking about? I mean, they, they sound like a, a real viable option for us. Somebody put in the chat a, a, a company called Arbico or Arbico Organics? Or, or Arbico, yes. Uh, they, they, I bought from them before and they have reliable uh, a company. And so uh, I would go with them uh, because when they ship it to you, uh, other companies I've gone with, they ship the, uh, the bugs to you, you, you get them and they're all dead. Uh, so you gotta be careful. Uh, the, the problem is, and this sort of go back to uh, the theory of pest management. Uh, the only bug I really recommend that you buy is aureus insidiosus, the, uh, the, the, the insidious flower bug. And the reason for this is because they're very tiny and they like flowers. So if you have thrips in your flowers, I would suggest you buy aureus, release the aureus into your flowers. 
Now, the other things that we could buy, they're more generalists. And if you release them into your garden and your garden is not very inviting to these predators, which is why you probably don't have them in the first place, the guys you release in your garden are just going to leave. And so you just wasted your money. But Aureus seems to do a good job. If you release them into flowers, they will stay in those flowers. The other ones I sort of talked about, they're not going to stick around. And so I, I encourage you to make for a better home for these natural enemies rather than try to buy them and release them. If you're in a greenhouse, yes, you can release them. They're fine because they're in a confined area and they'll go with what they've got. But outdoors, uh, all my studies and all the other people's studies show that once you release them, chances are they're going to leave your garden pretty quickly. Can you spell Aureus? <laughs> yes, it's O R I U S. Thank you. Um, we have about seven questions about preventing squash vine borers. Do you have any suggestions on that? Yeah, squash vine borer uh, for gardeners are a real pain. And the reason for, for this is that the caterpillar, if you still have my screen up, caterpillar you see right here in the vine, when it's ready to come out, it comes out of the vine and pupates in the soil. And then it stays in the soil the rest of the summer, stays in there through the fall and the winter and the spring, and then comes out next summer. And so it stays in the exact area where it fed. And so once you start to have these squash vine borers as a problem, uh, they're going to be a problem year after year in your garden. Why? Because you can't rotate away from squash. You can't rotate far enough. What, what uh, commercial vegetable growers do is that they have a pumpkin field and they get squash vine borer in it. The next year, they move that pumpkin field a mile away because they have fields that can do that. You can't do that with a garden, I understand that. And so once they emerge, and they usually emerge in mid-June uh, as adults, and this is what the adults look like, and this is what you wanna look for. They're sort of orange, they look like wasps, and they're day flyers, but they're actually moths. And so they're orange with these black spots on the abdomens, and they fly during the day. And if you go out in your squash about now, you will see them flying around in your squash and your pumpkins looking for a place to oviposit. And so what they'll do, and what my research has shown and other people's, uh, they're, they're most active June through July. So those are the months you wanna protect your squash. Before this in uh, May, they're not active. If you have prominent squash vine borer, you got to protect the first foot of stem that comes out of the ground because this is where they lay almost all their eggs. If you can protect that foot uh, 15 inches of stem, and what happens is the, the moth will lay an egg on that part of the stem that's near the ground. The egg hatches. The larvae comes out across around a little bit and then it starts to bore into the plant. If you have some kind of protection on that, when the larvae comes out and it contacts that protection, it'll die. Okay, what can you use? Okay, here's that word again, spinosad. You can use spinosad at the base of your squash plant, just the base of it, not the leaves. Don't put it on the leaves. You're wasting spray if you put it on the leaves, okay? Just the base of the plant, the first foot to 15 inches, I would spray that. And I would spray it once a week, starting in mid-June. I, I know it's a lot of spraying, but it, you're only spraying that one little area of the plant. Do not spray the entire plant, okay? Just the... 15 inches of stem at the base of the plant. 
So when those eggs hatch, they contact the spinosad or BT. BT just does not work as well. The, the, the little larvae will die and they'll never get into the plant. And so that's what I would recommend. It make a difference if you planted later in the season or, or not? Yes, if you could plant, but it'd be real, it'd be late. It had have to be in probably August, mid-August. You'd miss the adults. Uh, they're going to be most active in mid-June till about mid-July, and then taper off the rest of July. Uh, so I either plant plant real early, you know, get the squash up and get going for a while, or I plant real late and try to miss the adults. Uh, and they're over positioning. Okay. Um, you showed some tomatoes that had some of that, that cloud damage on it. Um, the tomatoes that have been fed on by stink bugs, can you still use those that maybe make sauces out of them? Oh, sure. Uh, the, 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 it's not damaged. They don't put anything into the tomato. They just suck the juices out. Uh, the stink bugs do. It's called cloudy spot. Uh, so the tomato is perfectly fine to eat. Uh, the only thing you'll be eating are empty cells. You, that's it. So I just go ahead and eat the empty cells. I know some people think don't want to do that, and that's fine. You can cut it out and put it on your salad. Doesn't bother me. I know some people are a little more squeamish about it, uh, but th there's no enzyme or poison or anything in that tomato. Okay, cool. Um, do you have any advice for flea beetles on strawberries? Oh boy. Uh, that's a tough one. Uh, the flea beetles, like I said, are hard to control. Um, I know you don't want to use the harder chemicals, the pyrethroid, the synthetic products will kill the flea beetles dead. Okay. And once you spray them, they will last for a long time. And that's one of the things people worry about because it lasts. And I don't think you probably want to put those on strawberries that are fruiting. Uh, so the, the, the one thing you could use, uh, it goes back to spinosis. Spinosis has been found to do a decent job on flea beetles. It does not do a great job but it does do a decent jo uh, job on controlling them and reducing them. Other than that, uh, and I'm presuming you're talking about when the plant is starting to fruit. If it hasn't fruited then, uh, or it hasn't flowered, it, see, once it starts to flower, you got to uncover them and, and you can't protect them anymore. That's the problem. So, and, and, and that's where it is with flea beetles. Flea beetles usually aren't a big problem with strawberries, I'd like to see pictures of the damage that you're talking about uh, so I can see if it's flea beetles or it's some other kind of pest. That's, that's what I would like to do, but uh, spinosad is the best thing I could come up with that would be safe to use. Okay, um, would that be a viable alternative also for white flies on kale? Oh God, white flies on kale. I had a grower that uh, had to uh, plow down a couple of his fields because of white flies on his kale. Uh, and no, uh, spinosad will not work on uh, white flies. Won't touch them a bit, won't do anything to them. Um, you've got to get the white flies early. Once their population starts to build, it is really difficult to control them. And so you have to watch your kale closely and look at the underside of the leaf and look for the white flies as soon as they get started. Uh, the thing that will work pretty decently is oils. And so horticulture oil sprayed on the underside of the plant, make sure you get on the underside of the leaf. If you spray it on top of the leaf, it does nothing. Okay, you've got to get it on the underside of the leaf. The oils will basically suffocate the immatures and they'll wet down the adults and eventually kill them too. And so the oils, uh, you probably have to apply them about every four days because the oils don't last very long. 
Uh, the horticultural oils are very safe. Uh, you don't have to worry about getting them on anything, including yourself. Um, so I, I would use, I would wait, watch the kale for the white flies before they get started. Once they get started, there's lots of them and, and you know, you brush against it and you get this cloud of white coming, it's too late. Nothing's going to control them at that point. So do it before they become that numerous and watch for them on the underside of the leaf and apply the oils. Patricia and uh, Jerry, I, I know we're probably a little bit over our time, but I also know that we, we went a little long in our business portion of our meeting, but um, I think we're gonna wrap things up. Patricia, I, I, is there maybe one more question or Patricia? Or are we, are we uh, yeah, I actually have two more questions, but um, I think one of them we've already discussed, but uh, one of the questions is, is there a natural predator for cabbage moths? And if so, is there anything we can do to encourage them? For cabbage moth? Uh, that was that the was, question, yeah. Okay. Uh, there, there are three different types of caterpillars uh, that are good on cabbage. And one of them that I happen to like is called cabbage white. And it's a white butterfly that has a black spot on its front wings. And um, the... All those caterpillars, that one especially, uh, is uh, sensitive to braconid wasps. The braconid wasp will lay eggs on the caterpillars. The eggs will hatch and eat the caterpillars. And so what you want to do is try to bring in braconid wasps into your garden. And the thing that the wasp, the adult wasp like are flowers. And I know it's kind of hard to have flowers when you have cabbage in the early part of the season because we usually don't have things that are flowering. But if you can have something that flowers early in the season, some kind of ground cover, some kind of clover, uh, you can grow little patches of uh, white clover or red clover or crimson clover. Any one of those clovers produces flowers early in the year. Then you'll bring in these braconid wasps. And when they feed on the nectar and pollen of these flowers, then they want to go lay eggs. And then they'll look for caterpillars to go lay eggs on. And they'll pick on cabbage caterpillars quite a bit. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to jump in here, Patricia and, and Jerry. And maybe um, um, and thank you, Jerry, for your presentation today. I'm sorry, you know, I kept you a little longer here, maybe than you were scheduled. But uh, again, thank you very much. No, that's much. all right. That's all right. I was glad to be here. All right. Thank you. And just, hey, before uh, kind of close the meeting up, everybody, just one more shout out to, again, thank every, uh, thanks everyone. Um, and we'll close things up.